So also I hadn't gotten a special request that uh, to tell someone that I love her. Uh -huh. <laughs> you forgot. <laughs> you know, person with being my mother. <laughs> so I wanted to say unofficial, officially, without reservation, a mom. <laughs> Go ahead. You 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 know. <laughs> Mom, you, you, you know, you know. Hey, Mom, I love you. Very good. <laughs> excellent. All right, excellent. I tell that all the time. But I like to... Uh, all right, several weeks ago, Richard Wright, in his sermon, covered the Second Commandment. Today, today's sermon will be on the Second Commandment also, but it will be more of a lexical examination and also include additional information. Now, if you remember from my previous sermon on the First Commandment, I stated that the preamble reveals which God is in question. He is the God who brought us out of the land or earth of Egypt, out of the house of bondage and servitude. This preamble summarizes, summarizes the ethical result of the totality of all of God's commandments. Therefore, this preamble is not just for the first commandment, but for all the commandments, including the second commandment, which we'll examine today. The first commandment mentions the Lord thy God, while the second commandment functionally replaces this God with two words, graven image and likeness, yeah, sure. which become a type of God to those violating this commandment. Now, a quick review. Uh, the word for God in Hebrew is Elohim. Right, there are other words that are, you know that relate to him, but there. But this is the specific one here, um, in question, uh, uh, mentioning and we'll referred to in Genesis chapter one, whose root word means to swear. As that's what laws, in a sense, if you were to, in a sense, give a description of law, it's that it's something that always occurs, you know, uh, regardless of circumstances. It always occurs, right? So in other words, it's like it's a law. Gravity. So there's a law of gravity. You know, there's a law of thermodynamics. You know, these things, you know, if you were to talk to law of gravity, the gravity or, or you know, he says, well, why, why do you always act the same way? He says, well, I'm, 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 I've sworn to always act this way. If you were, like, you know, giving, like, an audio to it, and you would say, like, you know, like, don't you want to, like, don't you got, like, a girlfriend or something? Or boyfriend? Don't you want to take the day off or something like that? He says, no, no, I'm, I'm always, I'm sworn to always act in the same way. So this is the way in regards to, we talk about in regards to law, as in Genesis 1, where the laws, where God is now reestablishing the laws of physical existence without which physical life could not exist. In the same way, without Elohim's or God's sociological laws, ethical sociological life would not exist. We would remain in sociological Egypt by remaining in servitude or slavery to antisocial behavior. More specifically, God is also defined by the word ethics in the triposition of the Greek word theos, we've seen that before, as used in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. 1 Corinthians 1, verse, verse 33 uses this triposition of theos in regards to ethos. That verse is 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Evil communications or associations corrupt good, here's the word, manners or ethos. Again, ethics. Corrupt, corrupts ethics. Okay? Now, today we will examine Hebrew word letter changes which reveal the ethical intent of external or code words. Now this process by which the Old Testament is more ethically revealed is referred to in the New Testament in 2 Timothy 3.15, right, by a transposition of Jesus Christ's own name. Right, then to 2 Timothy 3.15, we read that, and from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in not Jesus Christ, transposition, Christ Jesus, okay? Now what's interesting here is that, you know, why would God change the name around in Christ Jesus, okay? In a type of transposition, when you read about Jesus Christ, reading about the person, right, Jesus is emphasized. When you're reading Christ Jesus, the Messiah or the ideology, the perspective is emphasized. Right? We see this here in 1 Corinthians 1.30. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made to us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Now that's not a person. 
Okay, but that's the ideological perspective of which the person represents, right? So again, when you read about those in Ephesians and 1 Corinthians chapter 1, about those who are faithful in Christ Jesus, the saints who are faithful in Christ Jesus, is talking about in regards to these ideological principles here. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. The four aspects there, which again, think of the totality. Now it's interesting, Christ alone, the word Christ itself, is defined in 1 Corinthians 1.24 as Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Now in the Greek language, the word there, and, kai, is also what's called epexegetical, which means that the power of God, or more specifically, let me give a more accurate uh, description, which is the wisdom of God. So here we see here, Christ himself is the power and wisdom of God. But of course, as we see here, that's one of the aspects there in verse 30 in regards to Christ Jesus. Okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, uh, verses 7 through 11, give us an example of the personal application of a judgment, right, in regards to thou shalt not muzzle up not when the treadeth out the corn. You see here, which is a judgment from Deuteronomy 20, uh, 25, verse 4, of which all the lie applies to us. If you see in 1 Corinthians 9, 7 through 11, Paul now makes that applicable to us. Okay, and he says, you know, he mentions that, you know, God does not care for, for sheep or oxen. He cares for us. Does he not speak all for our sakes? And then he explains the usage thou of now taking that Old Testament judgment of, 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 of livestock and now applying it to us. That's the way the typology works in the Old Testament. Now, the second commandment, you know, it actually elaborates the first commandment by covering all categories and specifically defines the external and internal meaning of idolatry. Now, you know, the first commandment, you shall let no, have no other gods besides me, right? Right? Correct? Oh, that means that I can have other gods before and after him, right? Is that what that means? No. Right? Yeah, because again, the preposition is wrongly translated. When you use the word besides, and again, uh, uh, Mormons would love this. Well, it says there besides him, right? You're sitting beside me. But that doesn't mean that I can have someone sitting in front of me and in back of me. So I'm going to have another God in front of me or in the back of me. See, Mormons can take that and run away, run with that, right? But again, take a look at Isaiah, especially in chapters in the 40s. There is no other God. I know not one. There is no other God but me. So therefore, you have to begin when you translate a text, you have to take the whole totality of Scripture, right, and then translate accordingly, which apparently in the King James, for example, they did not do. So we'll see here, even in you know, in regards to the first commandment, that. You shall have little gods besides me. Okay, what, what are gods? Define gods for me. The second commandment actually defines what gods are spoken of in, in specifically. Right? It actually elaborates in detail. It answers the question, again, what gods are you referring to? Okay, now, this is what the second commandment actually does. Now, beginning, starting in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, you know the commandment starts. So we're, we'll be referring to, you know, you can keep your finger in Exodus chapter 20, because we'll be going there in the description of these words. You shall not make unto you a graven image. A graven image. Now, what's interesting is that the word here, graven image, is a masculine noun. It has to do with knowledge. In contrast with the following word, image, which is a feminine noun. Okay, God is doing that specifically for a purpose. Okay, in one, he's using in regards to, in regards to idolatry, in regards to knowledge, things that you know, and also in regards to your own reasoning or thinking. He's covering both bases by using the, fe the feminine word and a, and a masculine word. Right, really, really how he does that. Now, the word utilized for a graven image is pesel, Hebrew, right to left, P-S-L, pesel. That's the word used for pestle because there are like maybe 20, 25, 30 different words for idolatry used in scripture, even in the Old Testament itself. Many different ones, and in a sense, each one refers to the type of perversion that it represents, the words are. But sometimes you have to do like a triposition or a transposition to find out what's being said there. We see that later on in Ezekiel chapter 14. I think Richard actually alluded to that in his sermon two weeks ago. Okay? So here we have here, this refers to a carved image, something that you take an instrument in and you carve something into. So it's physical. You can see it. It's not internal. Not internal yet. We'll get there in a minute. Okay? Carved image. The verbal form of this word, as a verb, is used in the same uh, uh, context of the tablets, tablets of stone. 
used in the writing of the Ten Commandments. So that word there is used in the Ten Commandments there. Matter of fact, we'll see two, verse, two verses here. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. And I made an ark of shittim wood, and hewed two tablets of stone, like unto the first, and went up to the mount, having the two tablets in my hand. This here, hewn here, hewn two tablets. This is the word here, the verb form. And he wrote on them the Ten Commandments, as is the first writing. Writing spoke to you in the assembly on the mount. This is the word here in terms of how he's now etched out in the stone, write the ten words, the verbal form of this word here. Like Deuteronomy 10, verses 3 and 4. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, 23, also, take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of your Lord your God, and when he hath made you, and make you a graven image, right? The likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath commanded you not to make. We see here, in reference to chapter uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 23, and matter of fact, the whole of Deuteronomy chapter 4, as was alluded to by Richard, is that it's actually speaking about the second commandment in regards to contrasting words, ideology, with something made, an image, which again, the human mind, it cannot usually, it doesn't take a look at both. It doesn't have both in its conscience. It'll either favor one or the other. That's why psychologically the Lord makes a separate commandment, and he's very adamant. Do not do that. Do not make that. Because the tendency is, is to look at something that you can see rather than something that you can't. And especially if it's ideology that's contrary to you. Stealing and lying and adultery and fornication and things that you already want to do. The nature pulls you to do. Right? So God is like taking away from you any kind of distraction that could like take you off of that and substitute a worship for something else. Because that's what the human mind does. This is easy. You know, I like this. You know, I can, you know, something to look at, a stone, a statue. But take a look, even, say, for example, the, uh, the caduceus, which uh, Moses had made. And we'll see later on that the people were falling down and worshiping it. Not the ideology which it represents, right, but in regards to just it as itself. And that was a, a, a substitution for ethical behavior, just the worship of it. Now, the word pestle again, is a specific word regarding an idol used for the purpose of worship. Again, as Richard covered in Isaiah 44. Now, let's, let's take a look at a few verses in Isaiah 44 as an example of this word. Isaiah 44, 10. Who hath formed a god or molten a graven image, here it is, that is profitable for nothing? Isaiah 44, 15. Then shall it be for a man to burn, for he take thereof and warm himself. He kills, bakes bread, makes a god, worships it, he makes it a graven image, there's that word, and falls down to it. Verse 17. And the rest of thereof, he makes a God, even his, here's that word, graven image. He falls down to it, worships it, prays to it, saith, deliver me for thou art my God. He makes it his God now. Verse 20, again of Isaiah 44. He feedeth on ashes, he deceives heart that turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul and say, is there no lie in my right hand? Again, referring back to that idol. Referring back to the idol. Nahum 114. And the Lord hath given me a commandment concerning that no mother shall thy name be sown out of the house of thy God, till I cut off the graven images and the molten image. I will make thee grave, for thou art vile. Now, leaving the literal definition, the external meaning in regards to carving something of the graven image, let's examine two letter repositions of the more resultant psychological meaning which God is really getting to. Now, a transposition of Pesel is palas. Tra tri transposition, not triposition, tri, tricycle, three, three places, transposition, two places. Like trans transposition, trans tra uh, you know, in the sense like uh, to uh, when you're getting like transportation, you essentially one place to another. Right, essentially. But now this is now, so this is our transposition, right? We make it now, the last two letters we exchange, and we make now palas. Palas, okay? This is the transposition of Pesel, which means to ponder, to think, right? As in Proverbs 26, Proverbs 4, verse 26. Proverbs 4, verse 26, it uses this word here. Ponder the feet of thy path. Ponder the path of thy feet. <laughs> and let all thy ways be established, right? Proverbs 5, verse 6. Lest thou should ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, who can know them? Proverbs 5, 21. 
for all the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. This is that word, the transposition. This is now thinking, reasoning. This is not something external. So we see here, in the second commandment, we do not just have external references, references of idolatry, but also internal, right? Which we'll get to, for example, in Isaiah, uh, uh, Ezekiel 14. The idols in the thinking, idols in the heart, okay? It doesn't have to be just something external. Something external. Now, a triposition of Pesel is Salaf. Remember here, first we were Pesel, right? Pesel. Now we do Salaf. Salaf, which is now a triposition. No letter retains its original uh, uh, position. This is now Salaf. Salaf. This word means to distort, to pervert, twist, turn upside down. For example, Ezekiel, uh, Exodus 23.8. 23.8. Thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise, and perverteth, here's that word, the words of the righteous. This is that word here, regards to here, a triposition of Pesel, graven image. Deuteronomy 16.19. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect the persons of the, uh, uh, thou shalt not respect the persons, neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise, and pervert, there it is, pervert the words of the righteous. Proverbs 19.3, the full system man perverts his way, perverts his way, there's that word, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. Okay, so here we see here, we now have here, Pesel, regarding an internal perspective in terms of perversion, as well as an external perversion, uh, perversion as which Pesel means. So, you see the brilliance of God by taking words and by this triposition, tr transposition, he now is saying a lot by just using one word. Now, that's absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And it's consistent all the way through. We'll see other examples as we go along. Again, truly, truly wonderful how he does this. Now, also the verb of this word, pesel, or palas, 5558, we see in Proverbs 11, verse 3. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but perverseness, there it is, perverseness of the transgressors shall destroy them. These two letter repositions show that the specific word idol results in a distortion from God's ethics. A perversion of thinking resulting in a rebellion against God's sociological safeguards. That's what these things do. The same concept is found in Ezekiel 14, verses 3 through 7. Ezekiel 14, 3 through 7, where, I won't turn there, but uh, this is where, of course, the Eternal talks about in regards to the elders coming before him, and they want to have their idols in their heart. This word here would be that word. And imagine there's two of these, two L's. The little. Imagine there's two of these. The little. This word here means to roll around, to roll. The, the, uh, F, the root of this word means to roll around. Again, idols in the heart. Again, it's like you're thinking, you're pondering and rolling things around in your head. Rolling around thinking, reasoning, making excuses, making judgments, poor judgments, and so on. That's what this word is. So here, Pesel is not used in Ezekiel chapter, uh, chapter 20. And chapter 14, but this word here specifically in regards to rolling around in the mind rather than etching as like Pesel uh, references and like making the commandments. So again, God's use of using these tripositions and transpositions. Again, same word used in Ezekiel 20 verse 39 where this idol corrupts God's name which represents his teaching. Same word right in regards to corrupting God's name, his teaching, his perspective. Right? Now, no image can sufficiently represent ideology. The closest thing we can think of is say, for example, you know, like if you have like uh, no parking and you have a car and you have a, a round circle with a red slash, we see that as, oh, that means it's not a park, right? Or say, for example, if you had one person back of another and you saw had a picture of a hand going in, in someone's pocket and picking out a wallet. And you put a red circle with a slash, that would mean thou shalt not what? Thou shalt not steal. <laughs> okay? Now, you and I can figure that out, but what would happen, as we'll see later, with the caduceus, you know, back in the, uh, Numbers chapter 21, where they had sinned, and God said to take a serpent, a brass serpent, on a pole and, and look at it, which, uh, God, again, Christ represents to himself in John 3 or 14 in regards to, you know, when he's lifted up, Right? Is that the same thing? People will just take it, put it up there, bow down to it, offer it gifts, 
yeah, I'll, you know, I'll offer my virgin daughter as a sacrifice. That's what will happen to us. Not following the ideology in regards to what it represents, but just it'll now. Hey, I've got, I got that. Like the Jews, we got the law. We don't follow it, but we got the law. Right? It'll just simply turn into that. Which is why God just makes these incredible prohibitions against it. Against it. Again, as an example, as was just mentioned, if you go to 2 Kings 18.4, now again, this is from Numbers 21, where the situation with the brown serpent, but what do we read here? This is of King Hezekiah, 2 Corinthians, 2 King, 2 Kings 18.4. He, Hezekiah, removed the high places and break down images and cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made, for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. All right? Not going back to Numbers 21, that what does this represent? What does this mean ideologically? What did we do? And then what was the result? What was the, the prescription that God gave us to now uh, uh, you know, alleviate that transgression, transgression that we did? No. It's just, again, here, just, again, we see here, uh, burn incense to it. That's it. No change of behavior, no reference to sin, nothing. Danger of idolatry. Again, truly, danger of idolatry. And again, Deuteronomy 4, 28 gives us the rationale of this. And there you shall serve gods of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor smell. That's the result there of God, you know, not the living God, who intervenes and acts and, you know, uh, uh, does all the things that he does here, but they can do nothing for you. And again, but they don't make any ethical demands either. So therefore, that's why the tendency is to follow them. They don't tell me about not stealing, not lying, not committing adultery, right? Not uh, sleeping with my father's, you know, uh, uh, ex-wife or something like that. They don't, they, 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 nothing. So I just offer my incense, right? I bring, I bring gifts to it, but it doesn't make any ideological demands on me, sociological, behavioral demands. So therefore, that's why it's so easy. That's why God hates it so. That's why he hates it so. Mm -hmm. Again. This word pesel is a specific word regarding an idol used for the purpose of worship, as Richard covered. And we went through uh, so uh, yeah, we went through some, some passages there. Yeah. Okay. Now, or any likeness, back to Exodus chapter 20. Next word. Or any likeness. That word, likeness. That word likeness, here we go. Tamuna is a feminine noun. Feminine noun, and dealing with our natural thinking, in contrast to graven image, a masculine noun. Now, this word is also used in Deuteronomy chapter 4 regarding the second commandment. Deuteronomy 4, verse 12, say, for example, places this word in contrast to voice and words, which we just spoke about, all right? Of uh, voice and words, voice and words. We take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 12. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire, and ye heard the voice of words, but you saw no similitude, no image. You only heard a voice. So here we have here, he's contrasting, you didn't see anything, but again, the tendency is, like all of idolatry, is that if I can see it, that's my preference. That's where I'll go. There's something that I can't see, right? In regards to the ideology, hearing of words, right? That's why he's making such a big deal. You didn't see anything, remember? You didn't see anything. All you heard was my voice. So the only option that you should have is following what I say. The only option that you should have. Chapter 4, verse 10. Same book, Deuteronomy. Especially the day that you stood us in before the Lord in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather to me the people together, and I will make them to hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days of their life. These dead children, of course. Here we have here again in regards to hearing his words. Right? Hearing words. The hearing of his words. Now, God, okay, so in verse 10 here, of words here, this word is an external word, which, as we see here in contrast to word, is ideological in nature. Here we can see one of the forms, again, of psychology of idolatry. In this case, where the external images, tamuna is an external image, right, replaces or obliterates God's sociological ideology. Now, the root of this word, the root of this word, tamuna, this is the word here in its full form, tamuna, Tamuna. That's not when I dropped my cards. Mm 
root of this word, tamuna here, is the word here, men. M-N, men. This is the word here, which means kind. Now, you know this word from Genesis chapter 1, 11 through 25. And he made the things after its kind, the plant like the animals after its kind. This is the word he used for kind, after their men. This is what the word here, this is the word here for kind. Okay, the word for kind. This culminates in verse 26, where God says that after, in terms of kind, after kind, after kind, let us make then man or human beings in our image after our likeness, right? Now the word men is not used there in first, in uh, Genesis chapter one, verse 26. But the theology is evident, especially in the New Testament theology. I say, for example, in Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 28 through 29. Regarding us as being God's what? His offspring, his genos. Genos, his offspring. Right? Or in 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, and thinking the reasoning of the Lord, are changed even from the same image, from glory to glory, ice into, even by the Spirit of the Lord. Alright? So we have now, we have a change now, a more metamorphosis of being now, becoming something else, right? After a kind of our Father. Amen. Hebrews 10, Hebrews 2, verses 10 and 11. Hebrews 2, 10 and 11. Uh, bringing many sons to glory. Doxa, which is God's own thinking regarding ethical issues. Romans 5, verse 2. The hope of the glory of God. Colossians 1, 27. Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. Doxa means thinking, reasoning. John 3, 5. Being born of the Spirit. Of which God is. God is spirit. Born. Again, that's the same kind that builds that worship and was worship in what? In spirit and in truth. And we know from 1 Corinthians 2, 16 that we would have the mind of who? Of Christ. See, here we have now in regards to docs of glory and in terms of the mind. Thing, it makes it real plain. There's no mistaking. Oh, that's glory. That can mean anything. No, 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 no. You can't change the word nueto, mind of Christ. You can't change that. Okay, there's no typological reasoning or uh, you know, way to skirt that. Yes, other scriptures are of course, 1 Peter 123, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. So we see here, we, the birth now is by an ideological, by words, by ideology, which again, God stresses in Deuteronomy chapter four and in the second commandment in Deuteronomy chapter five. 1 John, 1 John two, verses, 3 through 6. 1 John 2, 3 through 6. 2, 3 through 6. Propitiation for our sins, not only for us, but the sins of the whole world. Hereby do we know that we, if we know him, if we keep his commandments. That's how you know if you know him, right? He that says, I know him, but keeps not his commandments, is a liar. The truth is not in him. By this, who also keepeth his word, is very the love of God is perfected. Hereby we know we are in him. He that, of course, abides in him ought to walk exactly as he walked. Right, right three, sure. verse nine, verse nine. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him. Again, we have in Genesis one, seed, you know, it's fruit, fruit, whose seed is in its fruit, and, you know, seed yielding seed. Here we have in regards to seed, in regards to being born of God. Again, men is not used in Genesis one twenty six, but the theology is there by using other means there. <clears throat> Other specific means. This we'll get into tomorrow as we continue on. First John 4 7. 4 7. Let us love one another for love is of God. He that loveth is born of God and knows God. That you're born of God and knows God, right? 3 9. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin. A verse that everyone loves this verse. Everyone, you always hear this. Everyone loves this verse. Whoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. Everyone loves that verse. Look at 4, 7, 5, 1. Whoever believe that Jesus, you believe that Jesus is the Christ? According to that, you're born of God. What does that mean? Anybody can say that. But ideologically, what does it mean? Okay? And verse 4 of uh, 1 John chapter 5. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the world victory that overcomes the world, even whose faith? Our faith is what overcomes. Yes, sure. Right? Our faith. Of course, you're not someone believing for us or behaving for us. We now imitate that. We would left an example, right? Something that in regards to you, a lot of your grace people tend to neglect in their understanding in regards to what actually grace means, what this function is. Grace to help in time of need, right? That's what the grace is for. In order that you not sin, that's what it's for. 
Okay, we'll get into that more uh, in, in another sermon. Now, the same word order of the letters for men are those also for manna, the word for manna. Now, what's interesting is that in the Hebrew, the word for manna is man. You know, you say, yeah, man. You're actually saying, yeah, manna. Because the word, yeah. Manna is the Hellenized Greek form of man. Right? You see, right? But in the Hebrew, it is not manna. It's man. <laughs> well, you're like that. Okay? Now, yes. The same word letter for manna. Man or manna is equated with God's word, right? His very words, it paralleled with both bread and God's words in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Deuteronomy 8, verse 3. Deuteronomy 8, 3. He humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word, word that proceeds out of, the, out of the, the mouth of the Lord, correct? Amen. Amen. Now what's interesting is this, wait a second. Manna was bread, right? So wait a minute. Doesn't this passage say here is that you don't live by bread alone? But if he's giving them manna, isn't that bread alone? Mm -hmm. Is it? He was giving them bread alone. But it says here, mm -hmm. by giving them manna, he's covering two bases. Yes, yes. That's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Okay? The manna also signifies the word of God. Mm -hmm. Okay? So by giving one act, giving up manna from heaven there, he's saying both things. Not only by the bread which will sustain you, because they, again, that was for 40 years they had that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right? We know that, right? But also in regards to the bread from heaven. Now, God, of course, now works with that perspective here, of course, theologically, all right, as paralleled here in... The book of John, chapter 6. Sure. The book of John, chapter 6. We go to John, chapter 6. We'll see some of these verses here that Christ speaks about, right? In reference to himself. We go here to John, starting in verse 27. Verse 27. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, right? But for that meat which is the everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him the Father has sealed. And then, you know, of course, they continues then, and what thought might we do that we do the works of God? And when I this work of God, that he believe in him that whom, whom he has sent. Right? They said, you know, what sign do you show that we should believe? Verse 31. Our fathers did eat manna, right, in the wilderness, in the desert. And they, as it is written, he gave them bread to eat from heaven to eat. 32. Jesus says, verily, verily, Moses did not give you that bread from heaven. But my Father gives you what? The true bread from heaven. Amen. Yes, right? Sir. True bread from heaven. Right? For the bread of God, right? Again, going back to that manna motif, right? That every word, that shall live by every word of, of, of God, right? That here, that uh, for, the bread of life, for the bread of God is he that cometh down from heaven and giveth life to the world. Right? And he said, ever give us this bread? I. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. There you go right there. There's the matter right there. Amen. That he that comes to me shall never hunger, shall never thirst. Mm -hmm. Correct? Mm -hmm. Verse 41, the Jews murmured because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Right? As the manna did. The manna came down from heaven too. Verse 38, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. Yes, sir. All right? This is the bread which comes down from heaven and that if a man eats, he shall live and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, my ideology, my perspective, right, he shall live forever. And the bread which I shall give, of course, is my flesh that shall give. Right? And then he continues, of course, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have life in you. He that does not eat my flesh and drink my blood does not have life in him. Right? Ending in verse here, for, uh, 58. This is the bread that which came down from heaven, as your fathers did eat manna and are dead, but this is the bread that lives forever. But of course, he's speaking here typologically, we know that from verse 63, right? It is the spirit that profiteth, right? It is the spirit that quickeneth, that flesh profits, profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and life. Ideologically, right? So we have now the manna, the man, right? Now referring to Jesus Christ, right? Ideologically covering two bases that you have in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, 
bread, not only the bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of, out of, out of the mouth of God, out of the, yeah, the words that proceeds out of the mouth of Jesus Christ that we have here in Scripture. Okay? Now, these two words in Exodus 20, right, Pesel and Tamuna, right, this word here, are in contrast to two different words, right, two different words, likeness and image, that have the same referent, yep. Zalem and Demut. Zalem and Demut. But, you know from Genesis 126, let us make men after our image and likeness. Second commandment, you not shall make you a graven image or likeness. You think the same words? They're actually all different words. The same words used in Genesis 126 are different from the words utilized for um, the words utilized for the idols in the second commandment, which again they're specific words, right? Again, in Genesis 26, Zalem and Damat are used. Heaven, earth, and waters in Genesis 126 parallel Exodus 20, verse 4. You shall make nothing, what? In the heavens above, on the earth beneath, and the waters under the earth. Correct? Yes, sure. Now that parallels this there in regards to Genesis 126, right? As to let them have dominion over the birds of the air, heaven, the earth, the beasts of the field, the earth, and then, of course, now, the creatures, the fish that are in the sea, right? So here we have now a dominion in 126 over those things, which picture emotions, ideological, heavens, unseen, earth seen, and then we have now, we have now the waters, which now we have life there, which again, since if you were to open up the water and then reach down, you would get fish and water and sand and rocks, you would have physicality. So it represents the actual physicality of our nature that's inside. Whereas if I were to go up to heaven and get a box and come down and open it up, you would see nothing. Ethereal means to deal with the unseen, the mental aspects, right? So he's not using just cute words, right? But what he is saying in another way is that if you have everything from all the heavens, the earth, and then other, under, the, under the earth, you got to the core of the earth, what's left? There's nothing left. You have from you going down to the earth, the very mantle there, and then the other option is that everything else up in the heavens. He says there's nothing in all existence. End of story. That's why he's saying it in that way. All right? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay? So, in Genesis 126, we are to have dominion over these things by God's ethical image. When he says, let us make men in our image, after our likeness, to have dominion over those things. Right? And this is, of course, is evidenced in 2 Corinthians 10.5, is where we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, the prohibition of the idolatrous image and likeness of Exodus 24 is commanded because it perverts the development of God's image and likeness, again, at 126. It is important to note that the commandment does not prohibit the making of carved images of things in creation. The use of the word pestle does. Pestle is a specific, we looked at that word before, is a specific word regarding distortion, twisting, turning upside down. He says, no, you don't make anything like that that causes your mind to do that. But of course, it was making carved images of, of antelope and monkeys and zebras and tarantulas. <laughs> Knock yourselves out. It's, you know, it's nothing. Of course, but not for the purpose, again, for worship, which Pesel Tamuna uh, represents. Again, the words translated as very image and likeness are special words, real their special functions, right? Those things are which are what to not to be bowed down to and served or be enslaved to. We'll get into that in a second. Heavens! <clears throat> Continuing in Exodus chapter 20. Of course, you want to look at heavens, earth, and waters, right? Heavens. The dual form is used in making in the word heavens. Shamayim. We know that there are three heavens, right? Three heavens. First heaven, below the clouds. Second heaven, outer space, right? I, David, you know, by, just working by hands, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then we have the third heaven, right? Where God dwells. This heaven here is the word Shamayim, right? 
utilizing a, a verb here, a word here, that means to. Because guess what? He does want you to make an image of something that is in the third heaven, right? We know that Christ is what? The image of who? And whose image are we to take? So that's why he says, of these two heavens, no. But we'll discuss the third heaven in a little bit. <laughs> right? Right? Now we may become the image of God, okay? And God is in heaven. That image he wants, you must have that image. You must have that image. Okay? Okay, dual and form of Genesis 126. In contrast to what are called the heavenly places, right? The heavenly places here are, again, where the third heaven is. We know that from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, 12, verse, uh, verse uh, uh, nine, uh, 1 through 3, for say, for example. When we take a look here in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of all Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Well, that's not, wait, that's, that's up there. Yeah, but ideologically, you're supposed to be there now. Okay? Ephesians 1, verse 20, which he wrote in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set his, him at his own right hand in the, here we go, heavenly places, plural, right? The heavenlies, exactly, more specifically. Places is from the King James. But the heavenly refers to the third heaven, okay? Same chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, and has raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in, here we go, Jesus Christ? No, Christ Jesus. We know that from 1 Corinthians 1.30. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. All right? We're not talking about, quote, unquote, a person, say, for example. We're talking about ideologically here. You're in heaven if you're ideologically following the words of Jesus Christ and the theology. That's why it's Christ Jesus, not Jesus Christ. Okay? That's transposition there, utilized in the New Testament again. Okay? We know that from 2 Timothy 3.15. So we see here in regards to the heavenly issues. Colossians 3, verse 1. Colossians 3, 1 gives us, again, another picture. Colossians 3, 1. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Right? So we know that we can get there ideologically being in that perspective there in the quote-unquote heaven there, and of course now mimicking that image. We saw that from 2 Corinthians right, 3.18, right? That, yeah, 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are changed from glory to glory and to his, his image, right? That image we do want. Let us make man in our image. That's the image that he does want after our likeness. That image and likeness, yes. That is to be your perspective. That's your God there. Not the image and likeness of Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, right? In regards to Pesel, right? And Tamuna, in regards to those things which are non ethical. Earth, all right, is the tangible seen things in contrast to the ethereal and unseen things, okay, in heaven. Earth also represents the self, the natural self. Now, the Sermon on the First Commandment, which is available on Mark's website, covers that point, so I don't need to go into that now. But we are the earth. That's why earth is female. And she became a formless and without void, right? So what happens is that, you know, the earth it doesn't disappear. New heavens and new earth. But the earth shall be changed. But we have a new heaven, a new thinking, a new rational, a new reasoning here. A new heaven's there. And therefore, we have now a new self of ours. We are the earth. God has pictured us being in the heavens because that's where he dwells. That's ideologically where he dwells. Okay? Waters, right, equals emotional instability. I seen in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where the earth is drowned in the waters. Now, in Genesis 1, 9, the earth has to be freed from this instability, right, from this condition there that had been uh, uh, forced upon it now. And now there's a step-by-step -step development out of that perspective there. Now we have now not only out of the earth out of the waters now, but also now life, you know, the animal life, the plant life, the life in the, in the, uh, in the, in the seas. The life, of course, now in heaven, thinking, reasoning. Those lights picture, uh, picture of reasoning, thinking. Okay? This instability is seen in Isaiah 57, 20. Isaiah 57, 20. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. <clears throat> Jude 13. Jude 13. Raging waves of the sea, forming out their own shame. Of course, and it continues, they're wandering stars. Again, up. Uh, 
heavily referenced there, not being in the proper order or rotation as God dictates there, to whom is caused to reserve the blackness, the darkness of blackness forever. Okay? In which, uh, okay, in which, yes, we, get, we see here in regards to um, this point here in regards to Jude 13. Now, in Revelation 20, verse 1, guess what? There's no more sea. Behold, I saw a new heavens and a new earth. And there was what? No more sea. No more instability. No more, you know, they saw the winds and the waves in the Sea of Galilee. Man, Lord, Lord, save us. <laughs> right? He says, oh, chill. Wait a minute. Wait, 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 relax. Wait a minute. Oh, 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 oh. Right? And he came what? He came walking on the instability. He didn't sink. Even though instability was around him, including his flesh, he said, no, no, you don't succumb to the laws of nature. You succumb to the spiritual laws that keep you above in the heavenly sphere rather than sinking down like the earth under the, under the waters, right, being drowned in them from a flood, ideological flood, right? Right. So again, the new heavens and earth, there'll be no more instability. Now, another type of externality which obliterates God's ideology can be seen in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Mark 7, we take a look here in verses 1 through 8. We turn there and look, look at real quickly here. Mark 7, 1 through 8. Came together, some of the scribes of the Pharisees, right? And they saw some of the disciples uh, uh, ate bread without washing their hands. They found fault. The Pharisees, verse 3, and all the Jews, except they washed their hands, off lot not, uh, holding to the tradition of the elders. Again, ideology, words, perspective. And when they would come to the market, it was something, you know, that they come, they, unless they wash not. And many things that they do, you know, like, again, here we go, here we go, right? As the washing of cups, pots, brazen vessels, and tables. What does it have to do with behavior? Um, washing pots and pans and vessels and so on and so forth has nothing to do with behavior, but it's an exchange for ideology, ideology and words. That's uh, making an image of likeness of those things which are not here. We have here on the earth. I'm um, washing this table, right? I'm um, Shining this pot, and that's my righteousness. Right? And many such things that they do. Again, ideological, from an ideological perspective there. And if he says, no, why do your, your uh, disciples transgress the, the, the tradition of the elders? Not the word of God. Tradition of the elders. Of course, he answers, as Isaiah said, you hypocrites, with their lips they honor me, but their heart is far from me. Far from me. How be the vain that they worship me? Teaching for doctrines, what? The commandments of men. That is not the commandment of God to wash pots and pans in regards to being ideological. It is not. Okay. But you have many things that are done, even in the churches of God, that, have, that mimic the same kind of thing. Right? Ideologically. Now, what's interesting is that another form, another form of where words of ideology obliterates ideology is in the immediate following section. We just read verses 1 through 8. Now look at verses 7, verses 9 through 13. Continuing on, 9 through 13. And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God by his keeping your own tradition. For he says here, but the fifth commandment, Honor your father and your mother. Like I honor my mother when I say, Hey, oh, hey I love you. He told me to put that in there. <laughs> put that in there. <laughs> All right? Uh, yeah. Honor um, your father and mother. That whoever curses his mother and father, put him put to death. But ye say, here we go ideologically now, but ye say, look, hold up, hold up, bro, you know. Um, you know, if you say it's korban, that is to say a gift that you give to the temple, then whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, you shall be, uh, uh, you shall be free. So therefore you suffer him no more to do for his father or for his mother. By ideology, ideology, by tradition, by words, by ideology. All right, here we go, verse 13, here's the abomination. Making the word of God of none effect of your tradition. But rather than taking care and putting all the routine of taking, taking care of a mother and father, it's easier just to just, hey, you know what? Hey, there you go. Rather than I have to feed for them and cook for them and use my money to do this and buy for them and so on. No, 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 no. No, just, yeah, yeah. Dude, that's just easy. I don't have no problem. So my mother and father, hey, pretty much bottom line, hey, you know, later for you. Right? That's ideologically what it does. Okay? It makes the word of God of none effect. Right? It obliterates ideology. Yes, yes. So we saw, yes, yeah, so uh, 7, 9 through 13. Again, Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah 23, verse 27. 
goes into this, actually, it, 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 it adds additional to it. Jeremiah 23, 27, and 30. Which caused my people to forget my name, my teaching, by their dreams, which they tell everyone by his neighbor, and their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. Again, his name is Idiotes' perspective. Verse 30. Therefore, I'm against the prophets, say the Lord, that steal my words, everyone from his neighbor. They have his words there, but by these false ideologies of external and internal, they now steal and rob. So that, what, what was that? What was that thing that God said? Uh, I, don't, I don't remember. Right, uh, was, well, whatever. We have these idols, so we just go with that. That's the tendency that goes on there. That is the tendency there. Now, the effects of the psychology of idolatry, right, is mentioned in Scripture, again, in Jeremiah 23, same chapter, verse 14, verse 14, Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah 23, 14. I've seen, also in the prophets of Jerusalem, a horrible thing. They commit adultery, walk in lies, they strengthen the hands of evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness, and of course they are all like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's psychologically what happens in the mind, is that, again, you... Submit me and give me a pass for my immorality, and I like my immorality, and to be drawn away from that, to be drawn away from the fornication, and from the, in, from, the, uh, from the adultery, and from the stealing, and from the lying, right, fulfilling my desires, regardless of who gets hurt, so and so forth. Yeah, they, don't, they, they won't let go of that. That's the danger of it. That's why you have so many people that have left the church. Okay? The same perspective in Ezekiel 13, verse 22. Ezekiel 13, verse 22. Ezekiel 13, 22, putting into the context. Because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I did not make sad. Here we go. And strengthen the hands of the wicked that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. We hear that kind of stuff all the time. All right? You today, no one's perfect. We all make mistakes. We're all sinners, blah, 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 blah. And no one's perfect. That just The grace of Jesus Christ, you know, he died for us, blah, 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 right? So therefore, what happens? Oh, so what happens is that, what? You now promote rebellion against what God says. Because it takes striving, it takes going. We know that, right? We know that, right? That's why we have grace to help in time of need. But what happens is that, oh, so if I have God's grace, then what happens? That incentive to strive and to, to really reach so and so forth, it's not there. Because I don't, ha I don't have to. Because, right, Jesus Christ did it all for me, right? It's all on the cross, right? So, therefore, you turn now behavioral issues now into an abomination. I don't have, and I hear this from people all the time. Oh, Jesus Christ would die on the cross for that, blah, 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 right? Like that kind of thing like that, right? You are on these church channels, right? You hear the same kind of thing there, truly an abomination that you hear, okay? Now, of course, God gives the antidote to this in Jeremiah 23, 21. Jeremiah 23, 21, and verse 22. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesy. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused the people to hear my words, then what? Then they should have turned them from the evil way and from the evil of their doings. God is saying that if they would have heard my way, my words, they should have turned them. But what happens here in regards to not turning is that, what happens is that the reason why you see such maybe like a, 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 the effect is not so strong is that it must be the common perspective of the church where a kind of like a peer pressure is exerted, right? Even God's words, especially his commandments, are marginalized, even when the church is of God, by psychology of idolatry. You hear that so many times. You know, the churches I, I deal with and, and uh, I've dealt with over the, over the decades now. What is needed is a kind of a peer pressure on people, kind of a peer pressure. We see this here in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 24 25. Again, this is a reversal in regards to uh, this kind of ideology from uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all and just of all. And you're all saying the same thing, right? It's, it's not like just one person says it, and that's just some oddball saying that. But it's hearing it all over and over. I'm hearing it from here. I'm hearing it from everyone there. What happens? And thus, the secrets of his heart are made manifest. He's like, oh, man, you know, the, 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 just the guilt that comes on him. And so fall down on his face. He will worship. He will worship God, right? And report that God is in you of a truth. Okay? So that's why it's important that these things are repeated and done on a constant basis and by everyone. That you're not speaking something different than what God says. Okay? I have a peer pressure. Again, if something is constantly repeated by all psychologically, it becomes the expected standard to which everyone must attain to. Whatever the dominant perspective is, right, that will be what people will identify with. 
whether in agreement with God's word or not. Okay? The common perspective today is not thou shalt not. No, it's not. But hey, no one's perfect. We all make mistakes. We're all sinners. Our sins are covered by God's grace. That's the common perspective that you hear. You do not hear thou shalt not. And if you hear it, you hear it once in a while. Right? And again, just so infrequent that it doesn't have that effect we saw in 1 Corinthians 14. This is why God has so many protections against the first and second commandments. We knew about Deuteronomy chapter 4, right? You can read the Deuteronomy chapter 4. Give you that information here. Exodus 23, 13. Exodus 23, 13. In all things that I have said to you, be circumspect and make no mention of the names of other gods. Neither let it be heard out of your mouth. How direct is that? When I even mention, and now name, of course, is teaching. Now you can say Molech or Baal, right? But in terms of the names, the teaching, the, the, the perspective, the reasoning, right? Neither let it be even heard out of your mouth. Why? Because God knows that that's what people, those who are like weak-minded, some of them, they'll gravitate onto that. Oh, I don't have to do that? Oh, the, 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 you know, I, I won't die? Oh, I have God's grace and that the Lord is perfect, but we all sinners anyway? Oh, well, okay, fine. That's what it does, psychologically. You can damage people like that, all right? Again, you know from Matthew 5, right? Whoever does them and teaches himself be called great, but whoever does not loosens at least these commandments, Right? Shall we call this in the kingdom of heaven? He's, again, he's putting such great emphasis. Again, emphasis. Deuteronomy 12.3. Deuteronomy 12.3, regarding the idols. You shall overthrow their idol, idols, altars, break their pillows, burn their groves with fire. You shall hew down their graven images of their gods and destroy the names out of that place. The names of the ideology, that perspective. Destroy it out. It doesn't belong there. Joshua 23.7. That you come not among these nations that are among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods. Nor swear by them, nor serve them, nor bow yourselves to them. Again, reference back to the second commandment. Okay? No, he says you don't do those things. You don't even mention that stuff. Because that person there that's talking about that hears that, oh, I don't have to do this. It's like, you know, you're, you know the expression waiting to be offended, looking to be offended. I'm looking for someone to tell me that I don't have to do this. If I have that, then that's it, I'm done. My father said this, my mother said that, my uncle, but my grand, my grand, my grand grandmother said, no, I don't have to do it. That's what I'm going to go to. She said, they said I can have the ice cream. She said I could. Guess, guess what? I had the ice cream. They said that you got to be in, be in by 7 p.m. She said, no, you don't have to be in by 7 p.m. You can be in by like 3 in the morning. That's the one, that's one that you go with. That's the one that's the excuse. Forget that the other said no. This one said yes, and that gives me, because that's what I want. So I'm looking for an excuse to get what I want. That's the psychology of it. That's why it's so dangerous. Yes, yes. Now, so again, also reiterated, we saw Matthew 5, 17 through 20, listening to the commandments. John, John 12, 47, 48, say something interesting. If anyone hear my words, John 12, 47, 48. <clears throat> if any man hear my words, I judge, I judge him not, right? For I cannot judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges them. The word that I have spoken, that will judge him. It's not as if you don't know what the perspective is. You have the words here. But there's nothing out new that's coming out of the out of the closet that God can hit you without a clear blue. I didn't know that. that that's not written in the scriptures. Well, you know, I said it anyway. But no, he's saying here by this scripture there is that he himself doesn't judge. But he's going to turn to you face to face. We're going to go chapter and verse, chapter and verse, chapter and verse. End of story. And don't say you didn't know. You can't do that, right? God can tell you how many times you read that verse over and over and over and over again. He says, "Oh, I, I didn't know." No, no, no. Chapter and verse. He says, I'm not going to judge you. Chapter and verse will judge you. So therefore, you have to be aware and know chapter and verse. I'll be looking by chapter and verse. End of story. Not, like a, not, a, not, a, not you know, nonsense. Okay? Now, you shall not bow down to them. Not bow down. Bow down is an Old Testament word used for worship, which means to bow down. It is translated this way because of its context as meaning to bow down. That's in Genesis 19.1. Two angels came to Sodom at even, and Lot to get of Solomon. Uh, Sodom, Sodom went out to meet them, and to get of Solomon, and he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself to the ground, right? Physical act, bowing to the ground, right? Now, to bow down and to bow, right? These two definitions have an external emphasis, whereas the root word, letters of this word reveals the internal mental emphasis. The root of this word is shaka, which means the thought or reason. Shaka, thought or reason, shaka, right? Shak and a hand on the other, shaka, right, which means also, which means to think, 
Right? The root of this word means to think, as in Amos 4.13. For lo, he that formed the mountains, grates the wind, and clash with man is his thought, that maketh the morning darkness. The Lord is his name. Right? And again, because his thought, um, another word here in um, 7878, meditate, as in Psalms 1, 1, 1, 19, 15. I will meditate on thy precepts and have respect to thy, thy ways. Psalms 119.48. My hand will listen to thy commandments, which I have loved. I will meditate on my statutes. Another word, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live in Psalms 104.33. My meditation of him shall be sweet in Psalms 104.34. Right? So we see here that bowing down is not just the physical act, but bowing down ideologically, right? Being humble, meditating, right? By what you think. This is what you think uh, is your perspective. Okay, now I have two seconds left. Am I done? <laughs> All right. How much? How much? How much time? How much more? How much more time I got? Five. Okay. In about ten minutes, let me know. Okay, because I'll set the time. I'll just push the button and get that five minutes. <laughs> okay. I thank you, sir. See that? See grace? See we were talking about grace, right? See, it's an example of God's fifth of Mark's grace. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, uh, you said, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm, I'm coming along. I'm coming along. All right, God, you know, Mark's grace, grace, right? Okay. I've been saved by the bell by grace. <laughs> okay. So, yes. Now, what's interesting, I say something, it's always interesting, right? Okay, is that this word shaka forms the root word of the word for Messiah, of Messiah, right? You take that word shaka and you add another letter onto it, right? This has happened when I dropped my cards. All my letters became discombobulated. But the, uh, yeah, oh, here we go, here we go. This word here, sha, here we go. Shaka, right? Shaka, now here's the verbal form. Right, oh, here's the root word here, right? Shaka. Now, what happens is that the form Messiah, you put the mem on, and the mem signifies result or ideology. Shaka, ma shi ak. This is the word for Messiah, this is the word for Christ. Okay? Messiah, right? So, shaka, right, the word for Christ. Now, these words form the root of the word Messiah or Christ and reveals the mental perspective on what true worship of Christ is. As stated in Colossians 1.27. Colossians 1.27, to whom God will make known what is the riches of his glory, uh, of, of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, the hope of doctrine, the hope of reasoning thinking. This is more clearly stated, as we mentioned in 1 Corinthians 2.16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have what? The mind of Christ. Ephesians 3.19, right? That he may know all the fullness of God, not some of the fullness of God. He may be filled with all of his fullness, all of his ethics, right? All of Mashiach, Kasha, thinking, reasoning, right? Of which, again, that's the worship in terms of bowing down, right? Not my will, but your will be done. That's Messiah, that's Shaka. Okay? Now, you shall not serve them. The word Avad. The word Avad. The root word comes from the word Ud, which means to repeat, to repeat, right? This word is also used for the word for congregation, uh, for feast. You talk about God's feast. This is that word, right? And season, you know, uh, Genesis 1, 14, you know, the sun and the moon for the Mahabha seasons, right? And it means to repeat, right? So we see here, in regards to this word here, in regards to you shall serve, so again, the meaning, the actual meaning of it means to repeat, right? So we talk about, you know, you shall not bow down and serve them, Right? We know that bow down, we saw the ethical aspect in regards to shaka, serve them as repeating. So what is the worship? That you're constantly, it's the constant mind, you're constant thinking and reasoning. That is now when you are truly in servitude. That is it right there. That is the aspect that we're talking looking at in regards to the worship of these things here. Is what is your constant reasoning and constant thinking? You're worshiping it. Is end of the story. The, yeah, you have an external emphasis, an external, uh, external acting of it, of course, right? But inside there, that's the reasoning of it. That's the second commandment there, of repeating a constant ideology of these false ideologies, of these false idols. Okay? Again, together, they meet a repetitive way of thinking, uh, which is the root of true worship. 
jealous, going back to the commandments. Again, not envious as ishing, wishing the ill will on others, but rather desiring what one had that is desired. Because God is not envious, he's jealous. Well, I wish they would give me the worship that they're giving those idols. That's what he wants. Not that I hope they die, I hope they, they choke to death. That's, not, that's, that's being envious. Right, you got a new, you got, oh, you got an iPhone, you got an iPhone, you got two phones, and I hope you ch choke with the death on them. That's envious. God is not like that. <laughs> All right, that's why he's a jealous God, right? So, right? Visiting. Here's a big one, visiting. Now, this is one that caused a lot of issues, right? People think that, you know, visiting means punishing. But the word pakad also means, right, to visit without any indication of regarding punishment. Job, Job 7.18 that thou shouldest visit him, this is God, visit him every morning and try him every moment, right? What then shall I do when God rises up, when he visiteth me, but shall I answer him? What is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou visitest him, right? Thou hast proved me in the, in the night, thou hast proved my heart, and thou hast tried me, and shall find nothing. I have purpose, right? Thou hast visited me in the night, I am purpose that, that I sin not. These are the words here in regards to Pakad. So what happens there is that when you see the iniquity of the sons and the fathers, iniquity comes from a word meaning, it means, uh, the desire or lust or to desire something, right? Fathers comes from the same word here. And upon the sons, sons is the word bane, which means thinking, right? Or reasoning. So what happens is that not that, oh, you know, these people did something, so I'm going to punish your kids for, for, for what's going on. That's not the second commandment. He visits those who hate him because of what had happened from the transition, you know, from the tradition of their fathers, right? We know from the first Peter, right? Vain tradition received by, by your fathers. So what did he do? He sends the prophets. Turn from your ways. Repent. Change. Do good so and so. That's visiting the sons of those that hate him for the purpose of them repenting and changing. Not that, oh, they did this wrong thing, so I'm going to punish you for it. No. No. That's not the perspective here. There's more information on that, but uh, that's as much as we can cover now. So I've had my grace period of five minutes, third, fourth generation. I would have loved to have gotten to that, but... In conclusion, <laughs> in conclusion, there is no problem. The graven image and likeness of, second, of the second commandment is a prohibition to prevent against the failure of attaining God's image and likeness stated in Genesis 126. You see the difference? Genesis 126 is in contrast to the second commandment, right? He wants image and likeness, his image and likeness, not an image and likeness is wrong. He says, no, let us make them in our image. That's a good thing. But in Exodus 20, don't make after the images, those images of anything else other than me, heavens, earth, and under the, under the waters. Nothing, zero, not on nothing, right? So he's like, so images is a good thing we want, right? A good thing. So, two verses in summing up in 2 Corinthians 10 5, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts is something that's the knowledge of God. That's idolatry, inward and outward, and bringing every thought into the captivity of Christ, right? That is again here now in, in support of the second commandment there, that casting down anything, logismos is the word there, from logos, any reasoning, any perspective there, and any noema, any concept of the mind that is contrary to ethical issues, Christ, Chaka, thinking and reasoning. And again, ending with 2 Corinthians 3.18. Again, in regards to image, right? But we all, with open face, as beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, we do want an image, right? From glory into glory, from your perspective into his perspective, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen.